Hi everyone, good evening. I hope you're all well and having a good week so far. Welcome to the Black Lives Matter part two, Britain's Not Innocent talk, which is part of the SOAS Festival of Ideas. My name's Anisha and I'm a former SOAS student. I studied for my LLM here and I'm really glad to be back, even if it is virtually. Um, this evening we have four amazing panelists. Um, they're going to be presenting their work and perspectives on Black Lives Matter in a global context, focusing on decolonizing education and youth movements. Um, a bit of housekeeping for you, we can, we've enabled the Q&A function so you can ask questions throughout and it would be good if you can ask your questions in the Q&A box and not in the chat box because they tend to get lost. You can ask throughout the um, panels and you can also ask at the end when there's a Q&A and a moderated discussion. Um, we really want this to be interactive so please ask a lot of questions. Um, it's also going to be recorded and available on the SOAS YouTube channel possibly next week and it's going to be live streamed on Facebook as well so if you want to share you can do that. As mentioned before we're going to be hearing more about Black Lives Matter in the context of higher education and youth movements. Although the Black Lives Matter movement began in the US and the discourse is largely US centered we have seen in recent years and even more this year there's been quite a large movement within diaspora communities across the world for example in the UK um, the BLM movement started in the UK in 2016 and has gained major traction this year as we saw marches taking place all over the country. But also the toppling of statues, renaming buildings and demands for changes in the workplace and education with the work of organisations such as the Black Curriculum being amplified and the launch of the Free Black University to redistribute knowledge and promote a decolonised curriculum alongside think tanks like the Running Me Trust and projects such as the Young Historians Project. Um, the BLM marches have also reignited the movement to decolonize curricula in higher education, calling for a more accurate portrayal of history, decentering Eurocentric views, including global perspectives, and ensuring that academia is no longer an exclusionary space for Black students and academic staff. A movement which have, we have also seen building over the last five years, and one which would not be possible without youth participation. However, the Black Lives Matter movement is not unique to the US and diaspora communities in the UK. And we've seen the impact of young people demanding change in South Africa, Senegal, Nigeria, and across the world. Today, we're going to be discussing the global context of these movements. So I'm gonna introduce our first panelist of four this evening. Um, we're joined by an amazing panel who I'm really excited to hear from. And first of all, we're gonna be hearing from Aleda mendes borge who is a PhD candidate at King's College and a SOAS alumni. She has a background in human rights, law and international development and is currently researching youth movements in Lucifer in Africa. So yeah, the lady will get excited for your presentation. Hello, thank you, Anisha. Uh, can you hear me well? Yeah, we can hear you. Wonderful, there's also sort of things happening on my uh, board. So, okay, let me... So first, let me try and share my screen so that you can see my presentation. Just bear with me. Okay, wonderful. Yep. Can you see it? Can you see my screen? Yeah, that's fine, you can see. Okay. Wonderful. So yeah, hello everyone. Thank you so much for inviting me to be part of this panel. Uh, I'm here to talk about uh, youth claims for decolonization, perspectives from Cape Verde. As uh, Anisha has already mentioned, this claims for coming from the young people for what systemic change when it comes to the way we interact with uh, black people have really been going through all, all sorts of different uh, perspectives. And I'm here really to talk about Lucifer Africa and more specifically Cape Verde and demands from young people for like real change in, in society, especially when it comes to a detachment from colonial ideas, which a lot of these young people believe are still quite prevalent in uh, our society. So when introducing Cape Verde, first thing is always what is and where is Cape Verde? Uh, if you're Cape Verdean, you know that that's always the first thing because most people don't really know what, uh, what Cape Verde is, let alone where that is. So it's on the west coast of Africa, a set of 10 islands, uh, nine of which are inhabited with a, let me just, I have some basic facts of, of Cape with a combined population of around half a million. However, it has more than over a million people in its very large diaspora. 
uh, Cape Verde gained independence in 1975 from the Portuguese. And today it has over 72.5% 70, of the population being under 35, which is a trend in the African continent. We have a very young population in the African continent. And that's why it's so important to pay attention to what young people are doing and to their claims. It's important everywhere, but it's much more uh, relevant in the context of Africa because that, as you can see, the majority of the population, so you have to give them some space. Uh, in terms of the language, uh, Portuguese is the official language in Cape Verde, but Criollo is the language that uh, is more widely spoken. Everyone speaks Creole. And also just a fun fact, because it's fun as we start, uh, in case you're wondering, uh, because Cape Verde means green Cape, it's not green uh, in Cape Verde, and actually the name uh, derives from Cap Vert, which is the most Western uh, point of uh, Senegal, which is the nearest uh, point we have to, to mainland Africa. Uh, okay, so you might be asking, why do we need decolonizing? Why are we having a decolonization conversation uh, in Cape Verde in an African nation? Well, a lot of young people uh, argue that uh, although we have become independent in 75, there is a feel among young people as well as other parts of the population that that process of decolonization hasn't really been completed. Uh, I don't know how much you know about the history of uh, independence movement in the Zofan Africa, but particularly in Cape Verde, our independence uh, hero uh, is Amilcar Cabral and he was killed before we became independent. And a lot of these young people believe that uh, the process of independence was actually stalled by that process because he died, we, we didn't really substitute that ideological gap with anything else. And so what issued was more fulfilling of, yeah, we just get it done, but then the actual decolonization process, which as you all probably know, it's a very complex one and it's not something that is easy to achieve. Uh, so they believe that that process is not completed. And so they're claiming that we need to do more efforts within society to decolonize the nation and decolonize the way we interact with the state. Uh, so in this march, for instance, you can see uh, in the past 10 years, there's been a lot of energy coming from young people really trying to engage the state in changing the way it interacts with the society. And they, it's interesting that the claims are made really from the prism that it's a colonized way of interacting with society because you have the idea that there was a colonial power and that was very distant from the population because it was a foreign power. And then you have this national identity and this idea that you have a national government, but then this national government feels quite separated from society still. So then you associate that to a colonial interaction, a colonial legacy of how democracy and a political system should operate. So these young people, they bring back the image of Amilcar Cabral, which you can see here at the center. So it's the, the, the very, when you think about emancipation in Cape Verde, you think about going back to the ideals of Amilcar Cabral. Let's go back to the way he reflected and the way he put forward what we need to do to become an independent uh, society independent from the colonial power. And I mean, Amilcar Cabral wasn't just a strategist, he was an ideologist and he wrote a lot about you know, the philosophy of the colonizing and he is one of the great thinkers around Lusophon Africa when it comes to that movement and the discourse around uh, the colonization. So it's interesting that young people today feel like when they need to discuss this, they have to revert back to the image of our independence uh, uh, leader to, to reiterate that conversation that we need to have. And this particular protest that you can see here, uh, it translates what it says here is youth, what can we do about ourselves? So how can we sort out the challenges that we are having because the state is not doing it? And in some of this uh, placards, you can see, for example, in this one, it says the state is eating while the people are dying. And this one, I also find very interesting here with the white shirt. He's saying uh, MP, uh, I am working to sustain your family with my salary. So, because this particular protest here was in light uh, of a, a, a decision to increase the salaries of MPs and people got really upset. And one of the challenges in Cape Verde is that, so we have a half a million, around half a million population, but it's scattered around 10 islands, uh, not nine islands, sorry, we have 10 islands, but nine inhabited. So it's really difficult to organize. And so, 
you, you might have a very successful protest happening in the capital city, but the rest of the country might be completely oblivious to it. So with this protest, this movement called Mac 114, it was the first time that they managed to using social media to organize to have protests happening simultaneously in around four or five islands, which was really impressive from the Cape Verdean perspective, because for the first time we were actually working together with for the same aim and it was really, really good and it was successful to the point that uh, they didn't really pass that law. And so it was, it was a, an illustration that if you work together, especially the young people, if they work together and put a coherent message, there can be some, some success in, in their endeavors. So it was, it was a very good illustration of that. And I think that this image is very emblematic of what these young people are, are claiming and the struggles they are having now in Cape Verde. And so I also would like to highlight some initiatives that have developed in the last decade uh, around the same idea of the colonizing uh, state society relations and the colonizing uh, the, the, the governance model of Cape Verde because the tackle is that they, they're trying to tackle that, the educational model, the, the way politicians interact with us and really challenge that, that uh, perspective that they have in terms of how they interact with, with young people as well. And Jumbai Libertario is a very particularly interesting one. Uh, a lot of, so it's, it's, they say that they are uh, uh, an organization that works on social intervention for action and citizenship. So they organized meetings with uh, young people and members of communities, different communities around the, the, the country. And they, they sit together and they discuss questions pertaining to politics discussing politics. And one very interesting aspect is that they always try to speak in Creole, because as I said, Portuguese is our official language, uh, but Creole is a language that everyone speaks. And one of the challenges as well with the same discourse around the colonizing is that the politicians will be there speaking Portuguese and discussing among themselves in Portuguese in parliament. It will be on live radio, but half of the population, I mean, most people, especially the, the least educated ones, the ones that don't have access to much privilege, will only be conversant in Creole. So you wonder, you're having political discussions which are supposed to be relevant for the people and are there for us to follow, but then you're choosing to speak a colonial foreign language. And so they do all of these big interventions, the, the, the Jumbay Libertario uh, group in Creole, and they appeal to people to speak in their native languages and to give you a sense of understanding that only comes when you speak your native language. And sometimes you can take for granted how important it is for you to use a language of communication that is native to you, especially when you're discussing complex ideas of identity and uh, politics. So, I mean, and another important aspect in terms of Jumba, Jumba Libertario is that they also had the, the sessions uh, streamed online. So for the first time, you could have a session happening in a particular neighborhood and people who were from different islands could uh, also join in and they could ask questions, they could be part of it. And more importantly, they could also include that diaspora I told you about, over a million Cape Verdeans all over the world. If they wanted to, they could be part of that discussion and they could be part of the change that these young people are demanding uh, from, from the political elite. So it is definitely a very interesting uh, project and it, they have very interesting initiatives and it's important to see that as also from the, from the idea of claiming uh, the colonization and claiming a change of the status quo and of the system in place. And this uh, also shows you again that link to keeping the language uh, Creole so that everyone can feel included and also reverting back to the ideals of the independence movement, again with Amilcar Cabral and that focus on the next generation and insp inspiring the population. And they also emphasize that what they're doing in their initiatives is what is absent from the educational system, both in terms of the language they're choosing because all education in Cape Verde is done in Portuguese, which is a, an issue for a lot of people, but also what we are learning, they believe that tends to be quite colonial. So it's a colonial perspective on education. And so to detach themselves from that, what is fair to them through the educational system, they're organizing this kind of more interactive, but also more engaging from an ideological perspective, education, which they're giving to people uh, in, in, this, in, this, in these events that they're organizing. Um, another project I really uh, am happy to share with you, uh, this project forms the core of the research I've, I've been doing for my PhD 
looking at young people and community projects. And so this community uh, project is called Pilorinho, it's an association. And they have one of their projects, which I find the most interesting as well, is that they wanted to have a community library. And it's not just a community library that these children from a very poor community can have access to books and can have access to a space where they can try. But more importantly, they tried to put together an African uh, a library and what they meant by that is a library that had sources that were relevant to the African identity of Cape Verdeans, which is something I'm not going to get into because that risks being quite long, uh, because being an island state that uh, really had a, a, a central role within the African um, with the, the African uh, slave trade. Uh, going in terms of from, from the African continent onto the Americas. Cape Verde was really at the center of that. Uh, it, it has a very complex society when it comes to the identity uh, of Cape Verdeans as Africans. And they really tried to put together this library. It has so many really good books about different uh, African sources, some African stories. And they're just books that not all are published in Africa, but they are about Africa so that people could feel that they could connect as a community with their African identity and learn more about that, about, about African history, African geographies, about to be more connected. Uh, and I find that a very beautiful project. And you always see lots of children there and they're learning things that you might not necessarily find in, in other libraries, in the main uh, national library, as well as in their school libraries. So it's definitely a very innovative project. And it's leadership in action, really, to see these young people bringing so much uh, change. And uh, the last uh, thing I wanted to show you is also the mode of their discussions is always very uh, circular and horizontal, where they're really trying to encourage people to interact as much as possible with each other in their native language and share political ideas in a way that is really not common in, in Cape Verdean society. So that's all for me. Obrigada. Thank you so much, Alida. That's really interesting to hear the um, Cape Verdean um, perspective of Black Lives Matter. Um, next, we're going to be hearing from Tasha Harris, who is a US-based educator and longtime advocate for Black children and families. Tasha is a mentor teacher at Codman Academy Charter School and has dedicated 15 years of service to a diverse population of students and families in both public and independent schools. Tasha, are you there? Sorry, these are the, the issues with doing things virtually. Yeah, okay, we'll come back to Tasha. So next we're gonna have Kumani Makwele, a political activist, scholar, and the founding member of the Rose Must Fall and Fees Must Fall movements in South Africa. Kumani is an international organizer of the Rose Must Fall International Movement, working with movement in Oxford and globally, and is currently studying for an MPhil. Welcome, Kamani. Hi, how are you? Good, thank you. I'll leave you to uh, give your presentation. Thanks very much. Um, thank you very much. Thank you to your viewers. And um, thank you to Soros Festival of Ideas um, for inviting us as um, Roads Must Fall and Peace Must Fall in South Africa. <clears throat> I thought that it would be best if I really um, commend the, the organizers who are organizing this um, um, serious uh, festival of ideas um, around the, the condition of black people um, around the world. And of course, the, the topic of the Black Lives Matter it is a, it's a critical topic for us in South Africa. I, and I suppose it's important for us in Africa to really articulate our um, lived realities as, as black people in, 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 in South Africa and Africa, and I suppose in the diaspora. What I'm in, really interested to, to touch on is really, um, to speak 
uh, about our experiences as as black people, um, black activists in in South Africa, who are constantly um, working on the idea of redefining ourselves in in South Africa, both politically and economically. And I want to really um, focus on our own experiences um, as activists in relation to Roads Must Fall um, uh, student movement in South Africa, as well as the Fees Must Fall student movement, and how these movement were able to, to influence the political landscape in South Africa, um, and of course, across the world. I, I want to really um, um, depart with the point that um, says that for us, really, the idea of, of, of Black Lives Matter was really exemplified by the, 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 the student of Rose Must Fall, um, I mean, particularly at UCT, who, who were able to, to generate and, and conceptualize ideas that were able uh, to influence other fellow black uh, people in the diaspora. And we, we are particularly pleased for, 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 for us as, as young black activists in South Africa because for the first time, a, 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 a student movement in the southern tip of, of Africa and in, 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 in the global south was able to intellectually influence uh, the, the northern uh, community, both the European and America's um, community in, in relation to the, the, the idea of theory and practice. Because for a very long time, activists in, in, in Africa or in South Africa in particular were seen as just um, protesters or we're seen as so-called barbaric action whenever we engage in, in political action. And of course, our, um, our movement, the Rose Must Fall, is not a coincidence of history. It's really um, a, a long historical tradition of resistance by Black people. We we join that um, long struggle. Uh, those of us who are quite familiar with uh, our forefathers' historical experiences, we join our struggle as far as 1500, um, wherein the British colonialists who, who came into South Africa in the Cape, who saw it um, necessary to colonize our people in the process of doing that is was to brutally murder our people that include the Amakosa king, King Inza, whose head is still today in the British community. And we still want the head of our king, uh, King Inza. That is why I was so pleased that this event is organized by SOAS, a British university whose responsibility is to really criticize and critique the historical role of the British community in colonizing the African society, particularly um, the South African and the Zimbabwean society. It is particularly interesting for me to really take this back as far as 19, uh, 1500 because we are really tracing what others call the frontier wars or others call the Tosa wars, which is the people's, the Tosa people's war against the, imperial, the imperialism. You would remember that in the course of the 15, 16, uh, towards the 1800, there was almost 100 years of nine wars that took place between the Tosas and the British. And those nine wars 
five of which the Tosa people won, and then four of which uh, we've lost. Part of losing those wars was to lose uh, the land of our people in South Africa. And, and, and of course, losing the land was to lose even uh, our way of life, our way of being, our culture, our tradition, our customs, because they were seen as barbaric acts by the slaves or those who ought to be, to be captured. But particularly for us, it becomes very important to then, within that lineage of history of resistance, to then link our struggle, particularly with what others call the modern history of South Africa through the eyes of um, Sir St. John Rhodes, a British uh, citizen, a, a, a British colonialist who came to South Africa purely on the basis of extract, extracting resources and brutally kill uh, African people. That's what he did. And therefore we, in the process of conceptualizing our struggle, we really uh, had to find a, 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 a position or a point in history where we can pinpoint, uh, at least in the modern history, a, a figure who was directly linked with the British community or with the Queen or the King of London. And that for us was Cecil John Rhodes. Ironically, uh, Rhodes, it is said that he somehow stole the land in, in the Cape, in Cape Town. And uh, subsequently, he then opted to donate the land to the University of Cape Town. Our primary question that we really asked was, how can you donate the land that uh, you have stolen? This is the historical question within the, the idea or the historical idea of decolonization. Because part of decolonization is to really revisit the colonial mission. Part of the of colonial mission was to colonize. Uh, colonization in that sense means that the control of the African people, uh, be it politically and economically, that control for us came wherein the land of black people was totally taken away, brutally so, by the murderers led by Session John Rhodes. But I, I, I really want to emphasize for us what we really are proud of as the contemporary student in Africa and particularly in South Africa is to really uh, to argue that we were able to intellectually force them to force the European and America's community to see our political contribution, not only as just a protest um, by um, barbaric uh, individuals, but to see it also as an intellectual act. It is for that reason that we are proud to have been able to influence young activists in the diaspora, particularly the American activist who was the first person to to pull down the, config the configurate flag in America, uh, Comrade De Rie Newson, who stated clearly that he, her action to, 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 to be able to pull down the flag of a confederate in the US was influenced by the acts of student uh, in South Africa, that is the roads must fall. But also we were able to intellectually influence the student in Harvard University who saw it necessary to establish their own Harvard must fall in, in the University of Harvard and of course, part of, of what we the claiming was to really question some assumption in, in, in Harvard University and in some of the Ivy League University. And subsequent to that, we were able to host uh, Comrade Justin from Harvard, as well as Comrade Derek from the from Harvard University as well in the US. And I mentioned these precisely because he, for, for, for a very long time, the, the 
historical political movement in South Africa, be it the anti-apartheid uh, movement, most of the time was seen outside the intellectual production, was seen outside the thinking uh, uh, people. It was seen only as if it's an only the act, um, the physical act as opposed to the intellectual conceptualization and the intellectual processing of what uh, Professor Mahmoud Mamdani call uh, theorizing the, uh, our, our, our experiences. We, I think we as uh, Rose Must Fall and Fees Must Fall, we were able not only to theorize uh, our, 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 our lived realities, but we're able to also to face the colonial institutions such as the University of Cape Town in South Africa by its own making, in its own existence. It, it is colonial. Therefore, it is that reason that we argue that, in fact, the University of, of Cape Town is not a university of Africa. It is a university in Africa that is almost totally implanted in Africa. And part of, of our argument is through the exercise of the intellectual work, which is then the idea of decolonization in practical terms, is to really critique the, the, the existence of, of our institution here in, in South Africa, but also to critique the colonial institution, not only those who are here in South Africa, but also those who are uh, globally um, situated, who then claim a universal existence and yet negate the historical contribution of the universities such as University of Oxford or Cambridge or SOAS itself. These universities contributed intellectually uh, in the project of imperialism and colonialism of the African people. Without SOAS, without um, Oxford University, Cambridge University, Harvard, and so on, the, the colonialist could not have been able to intellectually, that is psychologically, culturally, traditionally, to influence the African people to despise themselves one way or another. But further, what we are really um, thinking, when we think about our own contribution in the world, the world politics, and of course today we, we, are, we were able also to influence the student in Oxford University who um, after, of course, observing what was happening in South Africa, they established their own Rose Must Fall in Oxford. And this for us is particularly important because for a very long time, um, historians and researchers came from the West, of course, with the mobility of financial muscle, come to the South and do the so-called psychological or um, historical research. And yet when they come here, I mean, there was a recent, uh, recent studies around protest movement, whether through Abasali Basem Jondolo or uh, Soweto People's Crisis Community or, or treatment action campaign. There's always this interest to in Africa by the researchers as if the African people themselves cannot be able to produce their own ideas around their own political action or political protest. But um, the, the rose must fall. We, we were able to do both, not just to protest, but able also to protest and produce ideas and interpret our own action and therefore able to speak back to the powers that be in the West. Uh, Professor Habib, uh, Adam Habib, who's likely to come to show us uh, anytime soon, he himself agrees for a very long time in South Africa as a, as a, as a scholar, as a, as, as, a, as a public intellectual himself, he never saw the, the, the activists who come from the rural areas, the, the township of South Africa, who are really the poor student, who are able to produce 
uh, and the high level of intellectual production, ideas and conceptualize those ideas into action, he acknowledged the, the contribution of the black student in, in 2015, 2016, 2017, 2018, to be able to uh, produce their own ideas and implement those ideas and call for change. And of course, today we were able to influence the University of Cape Town, notwithstanding the, the resistance by the management, of course, even in Vets University where uh, uh, Professor ha Adam Habib is, was able to also sort of challenge and resist the student activists who were questioning whether the question of Rhodes statue in UCT or statues in, in South Africa generally, I mean, if you go to Cape Town, you find much of the statues, colonial statues, which they themselves somehow represent the brutal colonial project, which celebrates the colonialist power to influence a, and rule over, above, over and above the African people's lives. And I think these pointers are very important because um, even SOAS, SOAS is guilty of stealing ideas from African people, be it political ideas or economic ideas, more so politically. If you check since the 1960s, the most scholarly work produced about the African political project from Kwame Nkrumah, Julius Nyerere, Nelson Mandela, Oliver Tambo, and the likes is placed. That kind of political work, its intellectual uh, production is in SOAS, is in Oxford, is in Cambridge University. And even African scholars have to go uh, back to Oxford to find um, African archive whether of uh, Oliver Tambo or uh, Tabo Mbegi or Julius Nyerere, somewhere in the British Museum, our, 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 our archives are there. Now, what does this say? It says that we as Africans, somehow, we, we have sort of lost our intellectual production capacity to produce ideas about our own, uh, 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 our, our own action, political action. And create knowledge. That is why we argue that the Black Lives Matter, it becomes important only when Black people can be able to produce their own knowledge, disseminate their own knowledge, and have total control of their own knowledge. Otherwise, the Black Lives Matter movement, like any other movement, such as the Black Consciousness Movement, can be easily stolen both by the liberals, the white liberals, as well as the, the middle-class black bourgeoisie who will use their ability to articulate in an English language or French language and articulate the ideas of the Black Lives Matter movement. The, if us as activists cannot be able to enter these higher learning institutions, such as Oxford, uh, Cambridge, uh, SOAS, or Harvard, then our ideas will be expropriated by the white bourgeoisie who have always expropriated our ideas, will be expropriated by the black elite. We are very critical of the black elite who can claim about Black Lives Matter and yet they are unable to link our lived struggles with the communities in Helen, with the communities in the shanty towns of the British community, with the black community in the street of New York, the street of uh, British, to be able to say, look, join with the masses. And I would like to call upon our fellow activists to be very careful and suspicious of both black bourgeoisie as well as the white liberals not to take away our lived reality through the Black Lives Matter, through the roads must fall, through the fees must fall. We must present our own ideas. 
We must be able to produce our own ideas. Ultimately, we must decolonize the curriculum uh, in these universities. And the, the, the point that I want to make really around the question of curriculum, which is, was part and parcel of our founding statement as Rosemont Ford at UCT, most of the time we, were, we are asked, how are you going to decolonize, for example, the English language or science or mathematics? But there's the simplest answer to this question, which is very decolonial in nature, is that first and foremost, the, those, we must question those who teach the African history, those who teach, for starters, the political history of Africa, the political theory of Africa, who are they? Where do they get the authority to teach about Africa? Even in New York, even in Oxford, even in SOAS, we must ask this question because if we don't ask about those who will teach, for example, about the, the Black Lives Matter, somehow, suddenly, a, a white liberal student or a white liberal lecture find it necessary and find it ordinarily to teach about our movement. Yet the activists who were actively involved in the movement, who knows the logistics, the nightmares, the challenges that they are faced are kept outside this higher learning institution. And this for me, it is a critical thing because if we do not challenge these comrades who are willing to, 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 to expropriate our ideas, then our movement will die. Second last point that I wanna make is really around the question of the, the shared experiences between the, the African activists, whether in Congo or in Zimbabwe or in Nigeria or in South Africa for that matter, we must be able to say without fear, without gatekeeping our experiences with the activists in the diaspora because history has proven without the unity of African people, particularly the unity of peoples for us as Africans to say, how do we sustain and intellectually uh, uh, influence the global North in terms of our ideas? The only way we can be able to do that is for us to, to own our ideas, is for us to own our lived reality in terms of our action, both political action, as well as the theoretical intellectual production. Because this is critically important if we are unable to do it. For example, in South Africa, in the post-apartheid South Africa, we had um, the movement such as Abatali Basem John Dolo, as well as Treatment Action Campaign. These two movements were sustained by the black poor in the township of South Africa, in the shanty towns of South Africa, in the squalors of South Africa. And yet, the, the, the post protest moment, which is the intellectual, the theorization of this moment, the writing of books, the lecturing around this movement, the scholarly work around this movement is always, almost exceptionally, done by the liberal whites and the black bourgeoisie who do not see any link between them and the working class poor. As we speak today, uh, because most of the people are always asking us as Rosemans Falls student who, uh, who find ourselves, of course, as poor students, we're able to find our way through the universities of the elite and the bourgeoisie. But they were asking us, now that you are in these universities, have you linked your movement with the communities? Our answer to that was yes, because we were able, as part of our sit-ins or the occupations, we're able to invite uh, activists across the, the, the length and breadth of South Africa in the rural areas, in the shanty towns and townships of our country to come and join us. And today, the post 
a Rose Must Fall movement, which is the Black People's Crisis, National Crisis Committee that we established, in fact, is again the continuation of that work that we are doing. Of course, notwithstanding the intellectual, the, the, the international campaign of Rose Must Fall that now we are assisting our comrades in uh, Oxford University because we want Rose Must Fall to really and physically fall in Oriel College in Oxford. Therefore, I really think that if we are to talk of the modern political thought, I think we have to be able to include the, the, the contribution of Rose Must Fall, particularly the contribution, the intellectual contribution by the, the Global South. We can only hope with the uh, arrival of Professor Adam, Adam Habib in SOAS in January 2021, um, he will be able to unite. Uh, he will be able to assist um, activists across the board, both the African student as well as the student in the diaspora to mobilize around producing new knowledge and, 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 and ideas. And I'm happy that the, 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 the Festival of Ideas this year in SOAS was influenced by a Professor Ashila Mbembe, whom has, was himself a, very amazed by the intellectual production of Rose Must Fall. As a result, he was part and parcel of our um, series of debates around colonization, around uh, statues in South Africa, around the signs of um, the, the colonial uh, reality. And the last point I wanna make is really around the issue of our ability to reintroduce the 1960 project, which was started by the likes of Julius Nyerere and Kwame Nkrumah, of, and of course led by the scholars such as um, Achi, Achima Feje, a, a um, Gungi Wantiongo, who really try to theorize the idea of decolonization and decolonizing the mind. And we are happy as Rose Must Fall. We brought that debate to the surface in the 21st century, and we're able to really uh, pinpoint the signs and symbols that represent the colonization of Africa. In those words, I would like to thank you very much for the opportunity and I'm looking forward to engage in the discussion, thank you. Thank you Kamani um, for the South African perspective and the influence that Rose Must Fall has had on uh, the global movement. Next we're gonna have Tasha Harris who I've already introduced but is a US based educator and longtime advocate for black children and families. Uh, video. Hi everyone. So I just wanted to reiterate the, um, the value that I have as an educator. I'm a teacher at Codman Academy Charter School in Dorchester, Massachusetts. And Dorchester is a black and brown section of Boston. We um, serve children from K-1, which I teach through 12th grade. And we are in our 20th year of operation. And we are a social justice charter school. And as one of the mentor teachers, I have my own core value, which is I believe that young children come to school with their moral compasses fully intact. And that is my job to find curricula to heighten this awareness and to support, and to support an age appropriate, healthy racial identity development. <clears throat> How do I do that? I first do that by preparation of myself. I have to be grounded in what I believe and I do yoga, I walk, I garden, I forest bathe, I listen to live music. I have live, lively conversations with my peers and colleagues and I read just like everyone else, hopefully. Um, but mostly that grounds me in who I am and then I can go to look to who my students are. So I do an intake with every family before they enter my classroom and I gather background information. That way I know who I'm teaching to. I understand who my audience is, and I can craft what we're going to learn together as a classroom crew or community. 
After that, I identify anchor text to solidify the takeaways that I want my students to have. And when we talk about decolonizing education, the books have to represent the students, which is why I get to know who's coming to my class before they enter the gate. <clears throat> because I can choose a whole plethora of stories, but if they don't represent the children in front of me, then it's a moot point. The books really need to mirror the, the, the young learners that are going to be receiving that um, story. So one of the things we do is expeditions at Codman. So we spend a long time going into depth with a unit. And um, a unit in my classroom is getting to know you slash author study. So for the first 12 weeks of school, we're getting to know the students and their families. And we're doing an author study. And some of the authors that I pull out and search and vet are authors of color because again, my students are black and brown. So we're looking at authors like Kadir Nelson, who writes empowering stories with great illustrations for black and brown children and for other, other students, obviously. Um, but it's important that the text matches the audience. <clears throat> it's important that the students are bringing their knowledge to the table. So I also anchor the conversations with um, circles that, that allow them to speak and taking turns and speaking and getting to listen and hear what their thoughts are. Another unit that we do is called Portrait of an Artist, where they take a close look at artists, um, famous artists, and these could be anyone, right? But because I'm crafting it, one of the artists we look at are John Michel Basquiat. <clears throat> and I chose Basquiat because he was told that he couldn't draw when he was young. He's um, Puerto Rican and Haitian, which so are a lot of my students who share their, their heritage. And when he died, one of his pieces sold for one, a whopping $1.10 million. And what does that do for young children who look like him? It tells them that they can also do it. Like, believe it or not, I can actually draw. That's one of his famous quotes. Believe it or not, I can actually draw. So they have that mental model right there in front of them. <clears throat> one way we also like to empower students at Codman Academy Charter School is to give them voice and choice. So within this portrait of an artist expedition, they're gonna be coming up with their own creations and what makes them unique and special and spilling over their ideas onto canvases or, or onto recycled materials or even onto a large mural, which we actually did down the street in our community together. Another unit that I do with them is gardening. Um, from very little, we get their hands in the earth. We teach them the life cycle of a plant because what they're gonna find once they get that knowledge is that they can grow their own food. And if you know how to grow your own food, you can teach other people how to grow their own food. That's some of our indigenous wisdom and knowledge and it shouldn't get lost in a textbook. So we let the children put their hands in the earth and feel proud of these little green sprouts that come out of it. And um, we have a garden community in our backyard. But I wanna go back to um, preparation of the teacher because this year as we can all attest to has been a pretty unique year with the COVID lockdown, um, with some of the rhetoric that's coming out of our administration, with some of the instability of the voting process, et cetera, it's, it's, got, it's gotten everybody on edge a little bit, right? <clears throat> so at, at the height of it back in, my, in May, I attended a protest rally that was sponsored by Black Lives Matter at the um, end of George Floyd's murder. And this was in the same neighborhood as my school was in. And I was vacillating whether I should go or not because, you know, it's COVID. Is it safe? Should I go? Blah, blah, blah. I decided to go. And I'm just going to show you a quick video from that because it was, um, it was kismet. I, I'm not making this up. The song that was playing was wake up all you teachers. It's time to teach a new way as soon as I hit the avenue where the um, event was taking place.
So that sign, <clears throat> we are done dying, that was handed to me from, for free. Um, and it just sums up how I feel about the whole um, police brutality slash current political state that we're having as a result of police reform. I feel like um, we need to teach people how to start living with that context, right? We are done dying, so we're going to start living. And part of living in the educational system and decolonizing it is planting seeds. They're trying to bury us, but we are seeds. And that knowledge can come through my curriculum all day long, so long as I'm rooted in myself and I stand strong in my belief that young children are the future and I'm getting to know their families and I'm honoring student voice and I'm honoring student choice and working in an institution that supports my anchor. Um, they support my core beliefs because it actually supports the mission, the bigger mission. So instead of beating my head up against the wall, trying to bring these ideas into an institution that might not align with me, I've finally landed at a school where I can sort of um, rattle some cages and advocate for my black and brown students when things aren't quite right. I actually get full support for that. So that's, that's pretty much um, it in a nutshell, but I do wanna end, I'm not promoting this book, but I am excited about the fact that this um, exists. I'm trying to get a few other educators to read this with me because it is a book about white supremacy. Um, it's, it's called Not My Idea, a book about whiteness. And I've gone through my first read to see if there was anything that sort of um, didn't land well with me when I was reading it. And I was like, okay, there was only one page, no big deal. So I'm gonna hand this off to my next door educator who's also a woman of color, have her read it to see if she has any hiccups or she thinks it's also a, a great anchor text. And then we'll hand it to the first grade teacher who's also a woman of color to see if there are any hiccups or if she believes that it's a great idea for an anchor text. This is vetting books. We don't just choose a book and use it lightly because it starts and ends with the anchor text. That is how we teach our children with text and choosing the appropriate text is how we decolonize education. And we're empowered to do that at my school. That's it for me for now. Thank you so much, Tasha. And we'll be hearing from you soon on the panel. Um, next, we have Lola Olufemi, a black feminist writer, a Stuart Hall Foundation scholar, and SELS alumni. Lola left, uh, led the My Curriculum So White movement at the University of Cambridge. She's also the author of Feminism Interrupted, Disrupting Power, which was published this year, and the co-author of A Fly Girl's Guide to University, Being a Woman of Colour at Cambridge and Other Institutions of Power and Elitism. And she's also a member of the, the Interdisciplinary Anti-Works Arts Collective, Bare Minimum. And just before um, I hand over, if you could all just continue asking questions in the um, Q&A function and not wait to the end, that would be really great. Thank you. To you, Lola. Thank you. Um, it's been great to hear from the incredible speakers so far. Um, so I, I think I want to start with the idea of relation. And one of the most exciting things about Black Lives Matter as a formation, I think, is how it reveals and refuses the architecture of the racial contract that structures the way that we live. By racial contract, I mean the agreement and investment in a white supremacist nation made possible because of imperialism. I mean, race lives through the modality of class, as Stuart Hall tells us, wherein black life remains unprotected, easily exploitable, precarious. This kind of contract, I think, is what makes the border possible. It's what makes immigration possible. It's what makes the law possible. It's also about what makes the discourses about race as an innate biological fact and not a process of violent naming possible. What Black Lives Matter um, does, I think, or is as a movement, what it has the potential um, to reveal is that some lives matter precisely because others do not. Namely, some people's deaths are necessary for the continuation of this racial contract, as I described before, and all the systems and signs that legitimize it, the state and its institutions, lock this order into place and make it seem inescapable. 
I turn to Ruth, Wilmore Gilmore, uh, Ruth Wilson Gilmore's definition of racism as the state sanctioned and or extra legal production and exploitation of group differentiated vulnerabilities to premature death in distinct yet densely interconnected political geographies as a starting point for understanding the context that a movement like BLM emerges from. These examples of premature death are everywhere from in a British context, from unjust deaths uh, in detention and at the hands of the police to the deaths as a result of what Engels would call social murder. That is the slow and gnawing way that the condition of this of life kills workers. We're inundated with premature death to the extent that protest against them in the form of BLM is more scandalous than black death itself in this context. We know that many of the most unprotected workers in this country are black. We know that they are more likely to work in manual labor, in the gig economy and in service jobs, jobs that are the first to sacrifice their workers to the virus or to the prison of a low wage. Engels writes, but when a society places hundreds of proletarians in such a position that they inevitably meet a too early and unnatural death, one which is quite as much a death by violence as that by the sword or the bullet, when it de deprives thousands of the uh, necessities of life, places them under conditions in which they cannot live, forces them through the strong arm of the law to remain in such conditions, knows that these thousands of victims must pe perish and yet permits these conditions to remain, it is a deed just as surely as the deed of the single individual. Black Lives Matter, I think, emerges as a movement against social murder. And when I say social murder, I don't mean that this murder is constructed or that it is rhetorical or metaphorical, but that the very real premature loss of life is naturalized in our social world. Black Lives Matter UK emerges seeking the abolition of systems of prevailing violence. It's a movement based in community approaches to care, a movement determined to examine and dismantle the conditions that make it possible for some deaths to register as deaths, while others never even pierce public consciousness. In the UK, this movement has a really long and interconnected history. Black Lives Matter in its most contemporary iteration, which takes its name from the response to the first wave of protest and counter state movements from 2013 onwards, belongs to a legacy of anti racist and black led protests in the UK. The Black People's Day of Action that took place in response to the new crossfire, for example, the Brixton, Broadwater Farm, Handsworth and Toxeth riots in 1981, uh, as another example. Black Lives Matter belongs to a history of self-organization nurtured by the Black British uh, Panther Party and the Black Supplementary School movement in Haringey, which also had a presence in Bradford, Leeds and Manchester during the 80s. These were mostly volunteer led schools which challenged the whiteness of existing education and forms of knowledge and exposed children to the intellectual and theoretical contributions of those from the African continent, including the tenets of pan Africanism. I think such projects demonstrate the community based nature of the Panthers approach. They were investing in transforming the world through consciousness raising and socialist restructuring of their local communities. Panthers across London fought for better housing provision, legal aid, and resisted the introduction of harsher immigration policies in the wake of the uh, Windrush generation. Black self-organization in the UK is not just an American import, but was and is rooted in an internationalism and the specific struggles that come from being situated in the metropole. Much like the work of its predecessors and that legacy, I think Black Lives Matter is a response to um, an encroachment of, of on Black life in the UK, a call to recognize the colonial modes of organization that make it possible for people to lose their lives in the Grenfell Tower fire or to die disproportionately as a result of the ways that they are exposed to COVID-19. And here we see how whiteness works to transform these material consequences, consequences inseparable from capitalism, economic organization, housing. Um, we see how whiteness uh, reduces those to questions of biology. So as we've seen in kind of mainstream discourses, black people are more likely to get sick from COVID-19 because of genetic predispositions and not because of the way that the world is organized. That's a kind of prevailing discourse that's, that's um, emerged and re-emerged. 
what the Black Lives Matter banner does, I think, on a discursive level is make a claim for recognition, not from state actors or even from whiteness, but rather a claim that seeks to unsettle the premise by which some live so others die. These kinds of leaderless coalitions arise out of a necessity, um, but they place emphasis on the need for coalition through decentralized structures. Black Lives Matter, like some of the key features in the UK might be said to be a rejection of the state apparatus, a strong arm of international solidarity, a call for the abolition of policing and prisons, sections of the movement dedicated to grassroots community engagement and political education. We see the way contemporary anti-racist dis uh, discussions quickly devolve into the realm of law and policy. And what Black Lives Matter UK um, does, I think is situate itself outside of that kind of con a conversation concerned with the possibilities of revolution and, and what uh, the conditions needed for that revolution would be. Like most movements, um, it's helped and hindered by this decentralized approach. Decentralization obscures organizers from view. It makes it harder for the state to surveil them, but it also makes it, it possible for many competing claims and counterclaims to happen under the same banner. And in the wake of COVID-19, many adopted the banner of, of Black Lives Matter to organize unofficial protests in response to the pandemic and a range of uh, other issues, making it harder for a clear or coherent narrative to emerge about what this movement looks like in a UK context. But perhaps coherence, as we understand it, um, is not a necessary component of the kinds of revolutions that Black Lives Matter seeks to inspire. Perhaps those revolutions are local and global, localized and international, happening at multiple points at the same time. Um, I think about how movements appear more structured also as they become historicized. So academics like Paul Gilroy have critiqued whether or not the current Black Lives Matter moment is a, uh, sustained or robust in relation to past moments of political awakening in this country. But I think also about um, how academics like uh, and feminist organizers like Gail Lewis talk about her own involvement in feminist organizing through OAD, the Organization of, Afri um, of, of Women of African and Asian Descent, and the a Brixton Black Women's Group in the 80s. She kind of recalls how the work she was doing as a member of a number of organizations at the same time were never joined up in that official sense, um, but were still able to make an impact when and where they were needed. I think what we learn from black feminist organization and forms um, uh, of organization is also how movements like Black Lives Matter come to be hindered by age old structures that emerge when they are dominated by masculinist modes of thinking, by ideas of the singular charismatic leader um, who, who brings the nation you know, to its independence, for example, or, or when they fail to take into account pluratic leadership styles that can sustain movements in long term ways. When thinking internationally, we see how America and Europe become the focal point from which black life is understood. But the kinds of questions under examination cross borders. I think the movement against SARS happening in Nigeria as we speak tells us much about the legacy of colonial extraction and infrastructure in the organizing of um, black life across the globe. I think the abolitionist imaginary is clearly global and it doesn't emanate from a singular point. Black Lives Matter then also morphs into a project for decolonization. It aims to remind us what is threatening about mass movements, to cut ties, uh, to, to remind us to cut ties with settler nations and reject attempts to be reinscribed into the discourses of citizenship. It, it, across um, the globe, it, it helps make demands for land repatriation, the destruction of colonial property, demands for an examination of the impact of neocolonialism. I think there's too much to say about how the meaning of decolonization has morphed and been flattened by adoptions in, in institutional contexts. And I also want to be mindful of the over-reliance on building a critical consciousness or changing curricula as a means of decolonizing. But for non-rights, uh, quote, decolonization, which sets uh, out to change the order of the world is obviously a program of complete disorder, but it cannot come as a result of magical practices, nor 
of a natural shock nor of a friendly understanding. Decolonization, as we know, is a historical process. That is to say, it cannot be understood except in the exact measure that we can discern the movements which give it historical form and content. And I kind of want to end here on, on this point. I think Black Lives Matter UK asks us to sit in discomfort, to reject the idea that there are neat answers to problems that uh, to the problems that constitute Black life or that they might um, provide us with those answers. Um, they understand themselves, I think members of a BLM UK, um, as engaged in a, in a legacy of struggle, one that continues across historical fault lines and one that must, like the political histories it's indebted to, be defined as it emerges. Thank you so much, Lola. Um, and if I could invite all the panelists to come back um, for the moderated discussion and encourage attendees to still continue asking questions that can be answered. We just wait for everyone to come back on video. Natasha? Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you, everyone, for your presentations. I just have a few questions, um, and there's a few questions in the Q&A section that we can also ask them. Uh, there was a Guardian study this year on the universities which have committed to reforming the curriculum, and obviously there was quite a low number <clears throat> of universities that have actually said that they would decolonize their curriculum or make really big changes. Um, do you th what's the issue, do you think, with um, institutions committing to actually decolonizing and rather than just saying things like being diverse and inclusive? And do you think that the focus on Black Lives Matter and youth led um, protests at the moment will increase or change the pace of the um, progress of decolonizing higher education and also for younger students, Tasha? Um, I, I I, I'm happy to go first. I think I spoke to this, but it starts with the teacher in the classroom and making sure we land in the right schools to support what we bring. So I am my students. I represent my students. I've grown up in families just like theirs. So when I hear the deficit model of thinking, it irks me and I have to speak up because you're not talking about my kids. You're also talking about me. So it's not going to fly if you have teachers who represent the students in which they teach in leadership positions, helping to shape the decision and choosing, having the autonomy to choose the curriculum. So I think it really depends on um, teacher training and then teacher placement. That's how we deco decolonize education from where I sit. Um, yeah, I think those are two really interesting questions. I think in a UK context, we've seen um, consistently uh, uh, universities making these kinds of pledges and promises. And I think perhaps what's more interesting is thinking about the kind of strategic relationships that um, students and kind of ra radical academics can craft within universities rather than um, assuming that these um, universities, as has been rightly pointed out before, that are founded very much through colonial and imperial endeavor, have any kind of um, reason to, to even commit to, you know, the process of decolonization. I think there have been a number of, of conversations about what, whether decolonization is, is possible um, within these institutions, whether it's actually even a meaningful framework to, to um, um, think about UK institutions um, in particular. And I think more than that conversation, I think what's more important to impress on people is that, I guess, as Moten um, says, there are things to be stolen from the institution. There are resources to take and be re redistributed. And I think, um, that's where the main focus should be instead of on kind of written commitments um, to do X, Y, Z or a focus on diversity and inclusion. Because I think what the purpose of these institutions are in, in lots of contexts is to kind of subsume radical thought. It is to flatten it. It is to make it, you know, um, seem kind of impossible. And that's what the bureaucratic machine does with something as kind of unsettling as decolonization. And so I think it's good to return to, to this um, idea that even though 
you know, we might not be able to fully decolonize our institutions, whatever that might mean. And even if, it, you know, language becomes kind of sticky when we're using it, what we can materially do is show support to, to um, black workers in the university at the lowest levels. We can make sure that um, we, we keep what is radical about um, a kind of education outside of these more formal structures. Um, yeah, and we can make sure that we attempt to redistribute like the wealth and resource of these institutions to question their signs and their motives and 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 their ongoing relationships um, with neocolonialism across the globe I think well uh, let me just have a, a look I mean I think the um, the the change of the tide it's it's important whether through the pretense of language at the level of administration of any university for that matter. But what is more important, because the universities essentially belong to students, primarily, okay? Now it's up to students together with workers. That is why, I mean, this is the point about us, uh, Rose Must Fall and Fizz Must Fall at UCT particularly. One of our thing that we did, as much as we're calling for decolonization, we also called for the insourcing of workers and we're able to have the workers insourced back to the university and earning almost the same amount as the so-called uh, the real workers of the university, which is then the lectures and the professors. And I, I'm saying with agreeing with my colleague about the question of workers, that's what we did and we did successfully to make sure that because that's how the system controls itself. It keeps those who are out, out, and let those who are in, in. Now, I think for me, over and above universities being um, showing interest to decolonize, but the project of decolonization belongs to students as well as the staff. And of course, historically and contemporarily, staff will always want to be pushed. You can, I mean, in, in the South African context or the African context, one of the things that we realized and acknowledged is that the deep-seated fear of black professors and black lecturers. And this fear, actually, when we examined it, you would realize that a, a fear of a black rural student who comes to a metropolitan city at UCT or VETS or something, it's so strong. But equally, you realize the same fear was actually exhibited by a lecturer, a black professor who can't speak back to white power at our institution. And I'm saying that part of complementing the commitment of this university on decolonization is for us as students to take it very serious. Part of taking very serious is to push back lectures and force them to do certain things. And of course, what we acknowledge and realize is that some of the black professors in South African universities, they in fact come from the Western universities, whether Harvard, Oxford, Cambridge, and so on. Now they come with a particular sense of wanting to assimilate to the whiteness, want to be like white people. Now they are struggling to, to question white power. And of course, I'm not taking for granted the fact that white power, to question white power, you must be willing to sacrifice. Therefore we must, if, if you're gonna stand up and raise political question, you must be prepared that you will be isolated, you will be cut off the, the mainstream. And many people choose not to be part and parcel of those who will be um, uh, excluded. For us, I mean, some of the, the activism that we're involved in, not just the victories, but I was expelled more than three times from UCT. I had to go to court for the court to be re to reinstate me. Now, it is part of those sacrifices that we must be willing to, to, to endure. And I can imagine some of the black le lectures, for example, in Oxford or Cambridge or any other university in, in, in UK, 
They might be scared because they are few, they are minority. And yet my appeal is always that every time we want to praise the intellectual revolutionary moment, and yet very few people who are willing to face the brutal treatment as an activist you will receive for questioning white power. Same thing with the issue of, of transformation of the curriculum. Those who are willing to take this for, for the posterity must be equally willing to make sure that they will suffer the consequences. They are willing to meet those consequences because most of the time, this white power always make us as if we depend to, uh, to SOAS, we depend to Cambridge. We cannot survive outside these universities. As activists, we must prove that, in fact, questioning white power, it means that you can be able to survive outside this institution. But hopefully, the revolution will come, and then they, they have no reason to, to kick you out. Thank you very much. OK, so moving slightly away just from um, within institutions and over to youth um, movements. Alida, I'm going to start with you. Um, as you talked about in Cape Verde, how the youth were able to organize simultaneous protests across different areas um, using social media. And I know um, Kumani and Lola, you also use social media in your protests whilst at university. So what do you think um, are some of the significant um, benefits of youth movements and how do you help? Uh, how do you think social media kind of helps with organizing? Thank you. Thank you for that question. I mean, I think it for some for spaces such as Cape Verde, without social media, it would have been nearly impossible to organize because, as I said, we have 10 different islands and people are not necessarily well connected. Technology is very expensive already. So even connecting over the Internet is really expensive, but using the phone would be even worse. So if you didn't have the advent of social media to actually send short messages and to keep the connection going across different days, it would have been nearly impossible. And also, how do even people get access to information? Not just the communication, but just being aware of what's happening, being able to follow up on how the, the, the movement is developing, et cetera. So for spaces like Cape, but it proved quite substantial. But then you see the same thing with the movements such as the Arab Spring, right? The, the internet played a huge role in connecting these young people across different spaces and sending the messages across different borders. And for the Cape Verdean movement, it was important because it also included the diaspora. And the more people you get connected in these networks, the, the more successful the, the movement is going to be in terms of achieving its aim. So I think it's been crucial and fundamental for, for this movement. Thank you. Um, I'm going to ask one of the questions that were in the chat from um, Janek earlier on, who said, what if any differences do you think there are for Black people or the movement in the UK? Um, and I guess we can widen that to um, your respective areas as well. I start with the babies again. Um, I think the difference in the movement is that it's being televised, right? We like to think that the revolution will not be televised, but it's everyone's got enough. Most people have a phone and you can just record. So it's it's a civic, it's almost a civic duty when you see something to, I know I stop and bear witness now. If one of my brothers is being spoken to by the police, I kind of hover around to just let them know that I see them and I'm seeing it. I almost can't help it these days. But um, I think that the difference is the awareness raising, it's hard to deny it. It's not like we, we are no longer overreacting. We're no longer sensitive to um, white power structure and, and institutional racism. It's actually a thing that's being televised. So it's hard to deny it. Um, I guess I would say, um, I think the, the one of the core differences um, in terms of how BLM works across contexts, and I would say in a UK context is that, um, obviously because of the, the differences in size and, and also the differences in um, infrastructure that's available for um, 
a specific kind of critical movement. I think what we've seen in, in the past like 10 years in the UK is the complete um, kind of decimation of infrastructures of, of social and public care. And, and that means that things, spaces where critical consciousness might be cultivated, that is in the youth club, that is in the community center, that is in spaces where um, people might come together, those don't really exist in a, in a um, centralized and robust way in the UK. And so I think um, like I said, there is a, a real sense of decentralization um, it, within any kind of social um, movement in the UK, precisely because of that reason. And and in ways that there are um, obviously advantages and, and um, disadvantages to that. But I think there tends to be what is a really interesting, I guess, um, discourse about black history in the UK as somehow needing to constantly be recovered or not being um, put front and center, which I think is very interesting because um, the, the radical histories of um, people responding to power, people responding to the state, people resp responding to um, racism and, and premature death, not only do they exist, they're also rich histories that we might be able to draw on um, in order to sustain the movements that are, are happening at the moment. Um, and so I think one thing that's a, a really key feature in terms of um, uh, kind of British grappling with a, a critical consciousness around race is this idea that like we, we are somehow disconnected from our history, which I think is a, a, an interesting way to think of history as somehow linear and us needing to go back to recover it instead of thinking about a kind of fragmentary history where we might be able to pick up on fragments in order to um, uh, uh, advise ourselves or in order to, to look back and see what strategies have worked in um, the past and what strategies might help us um, uh, carry on in the moment. And I think on the question of, of social media, I think social media is helpful in as much as it, um, as um, Aleda said, can cross help us cross borders and share strategies between different movements that have the same um, aims in different contexts. I think social media is also obviously a tool for surveillance and, and a way through which um, movements or, of critical consciousness are um, derailed or sensationalized or made to seem um, kind of in, uh, trapped within these discourses of impossibility or, or outrage or sensationalism. Um, and so I think we have to be really um, strategic and really careful about the ways in which we utilize um, social media and, and really understand what it can offer to our movements, but also the, the many things, the many ways it might hinder our attempts to, you know, raise certain issues. Well, um, I just, maybe I should add just one point in relation to the, the youth movement. And really my, my my challenge that I'm trying to think through as we organize in the metropole, which is the cities, the big cities, is how much organization that is taking place in the rural, in the township, in the shanty towns. Because also the, the idea of activism um, might also be affected by the class question. Uh, if we are not as, as activists, thinking around of involving those who are not at university, those who are not um, in big cities, because most of the movement, you realize that um, it's always around the, the, the major cities. But I think for me, the, the idea of the, the youth movement, and of course the benefit thereof, and I mean, it cannot over be ever overemphasized the idea of social media, it's good, but of course, what I realize is that um, with the, the nature of instantness of our, um, of our times, everything is instant. What is happening is that there's a likelihood that um, the, the, the idea of a sustained movement might be lacking. And for us, we are facing that because people are always trying to catch up on the next thing. And, and of course, to change the course of history or to change the social structure that we are under, it means that you must at least have a movement that can be able to sustain itself in the course between one year to five years so that you can be able to see the real change on the ground. 
because most people think that things would just happen uh, within two days of protest, which is that's not the case. And of course, again, um, I suppose the, the main issue here is the modes of protest, the modes of organization, the modes of mobilization, and how do we link? This is the challenge that is really facing the, um, the middle class, the upper class activists, particularly at the university. You, you can find at university, for example, the most radical professors. And yet what I've realized, they, they are, their limitation is that they are always unable to break away from the comfort of the ivory tower. I think as young activists, we must be wary of the comfortabilities of the, the, the ivory tower. And um, uh, I mean, even Fainon, uh, Fainon suffered through this idea of limitation of the ivory tower, always in the city, always in the university, in the workplace of the, the modern city. And how do we overcome that? Our educational and uh, colonial uh, decolonization of education processes, how do we have linkage and relations with the, the poorest of the poor in the rural areas, in the farm towns, in the shanty towns and townships of our areas? I mean, I, mean, I, I always think about I mean, young people in Congo today as black activists um, in, in Cape Town or in, in UK, wherever. And I'm thinking about the young people in Nigeria, you know, the suffering that they're going through, those particularly those who are in the rural. How do we organize those young people? How do we share our experiences? Because the greatest limitation I can tell you now is the fear to go where there is no resources, is the fear to go where there's no comfortability. As university student, how are we gonna change this thing as we uh, grow uh, entering in the space of the mainstream politics? Because I think if we prepare ourselves now, we can be able to, to change the course of history because as things stands now, I mean, I was listening to the president of Ghana, um, how he tried to make sense of the Chinese relationship between China and, uh, and Africa. And then he says, we are going to the relationship with China with eyes open. What does that mean? It means that years after years, the relationship between African countries and the Chinese or the Europeans or the American, it has always put in the forefront the interest of the, 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 the Western powers. I think for me, we have really a challenge as activists to say, how do we integrate our activism so that our activism does not only end in the metropolitan um, cities, but it goes to the rural areas because that's where the real change is needed so that we can be able to see the material condition. But also we must be able to be prepared to really um, not expect things to happen instantly but to allow a five year, 10 year period of being engaged in the activism exercise. Thank you. So I have one last question. Um, oh, Alida, please go. So I just wanted to add to that a really important point about connecting this, the different uh, social movements. And it's, I always found it quite interesting in a lot of social movements that happen in the continent. The Cape Verdean case is slightly different, which I hope you appreciate it. It comes really from the bottom and they still don't engage the university population, which is really interesting. So you either have one side or you have the other, but you don't seem to have both as Shumani is, is highlighting. And I think there's strengths in different uh, uh, different types of, of protests because the bottom-up approach is really interesting because you really have the community engaging with it and the people from the countryside as you said so it has a wider reach because in most of our societies the educated you know, slash university population is happens to be the minority so you have a much wider reach when you're doing it from the bottom up but then you still don't interact with what we call the organic intellectuals right you don't in interact with those people that have the means of production so it, they remain mostly very marginal, this, this movement. However, a very interesting point with the, the last association that I mentioned, the Pilorino, they've been working actually for more than 10 years now. And it's really interesting how they've kept 
the, the influence and the, the, the works. And it's particularly because they have very stable projects where they're working mostly with children. So they managed to even get funding from the, the government because yes, they have this very strong uh, desire to decolonize, but they are really targeting children. So they're educating children about Africa. They're educating them about having an open and political mind. So not just being on the receiving end of what happens in society, but they have, they, they've learned that they have different streams and they've had problems because of that, because the movement is wide, but then some of them are much more, you know, uh, they, 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 they tend to be less radical. So they work with children and they try to do that with slow progress where others just want to go and protest and fight against the government. They've managed to have two streams working at the same time with the many problems involved, but it seems to be working. So there is scope for that to happen. It's just not easy. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, well, just the last question. Um, I'm getting a five minute warning from the moderator. So I'm going to ask you all to keep your answers to maybe 30 seconds. Um, just looking at the Q&A's, there's a, a question about whether we should just break away and really do it for ourselves. And then also a question about whether we how to interact with new institutions that have now changed their name. So an institution that has removed Cecil Rhodes from their name. So I guess I'm going to flip the question and have it as do you think it's possible to do it on your own, for example, movements like the Black Curriculum, or whether we should stick with working within the institutions, for example, with Tasha, where we've heard she has a supportive um, institution, and maybe because it's a charter school, there's more freedom, which do you think is like the best way to move forward at the moment? I think I'll go first. Um, I think it's both and. I think there are some people that are going to go with the, um, the idea of of going over here and doing it for ourselves, right? Like the Garvey, the Garvey movement. But then there are also people that are gonna be like, no, I'm not ready for that. So we need to do both and. I choose to work at an institution where my, um, my frontline knowledge and community experience is celebrated and recognized and compensated. My ideas are given resources so I can stay here and be happy to interrogate the system from here, from where I sit on behalf of my students and families. But I also think it is important to have institutions where, where people can go into that are Afrocentric curriculum. Um, I can, pro off the top of my head, I'm, I'm struggling to name some actually. So I, I think there is a wide open field for that. I would, I would love to support educators who are ready to do that. Well, if I just go after, I, I will address the question about what to do with these new community centers that emerge. I would, I would say that as, as I, I took experience from the projects I've been working with, start with children. It's the best way. Start with children, start light, get the community on board, start working with questions that are relevant to the community where this community center is uh, located. And then once you get established, then you can push forward an agenda. But I think if, if it's just, I mean, change after change sometimes can be difficult. So start with small changes. Working with children is phenomenal because you can really shape them and you can put forward really interesting ideas. They go home and they work with their parents. And next thing you know, the community has a lot more cohesion and you can develop ideas. I like what Shumani said. It's time. Things take time. Change takes time. And you have to be very patient and be willing to actually put the effort for, to, to endure what it takes to get the, the ideas forward. I mean, change doesn't happen. Uh, within the next day. All right, let, let me just cover this. Um, the, I mean, the Gavian approach is a beautiful approach, um, but of course it has limitation. I would really um, argue that we ought to do both. You know, for example, in South Africa, we've got a very peculiar um practice around for example the ngo sector where as activists we even came to a conclusion that it is hard to establish a, a black led ngo like an ngo that is led by black people and then we the the honest truth about it which is almost a racial connotation is that most NGO in South Africa are led by white people. And the irony about these NGOs, they are about the very issues that we're contesting in our communities. But the funding 
funding come from the, the funders, of course, it comes from the funders to only NGOs that have white people involved. And the historical reason for that, that's why I'm saying it might be linked with history of racism, is the belief that it's only white people who are accountable, who can be able to account for those resources. For example, there's an, the NGO in South Africa called the Children of South Africa. And then if you go to the, the website of this NGO, it's really kids from the township, from the rural areas, and then the board members and the founder are white people. Now, you can ask that why black people don't start something like that themselves in the township, because we come from there, we were born there, why don't you start it? But the, the reality of the matter is that you will not get funding. And they actually the systematic structure of funding generally in South Africa, you can really count individual which big funders come to in South Africa. And those individuals, then they disseminate the funds among their friends. It's really hard to, 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 to go alone as black people do the work that we are already doing without funding. But what we have concluded on is that, look, maybe we should then just work with white people and put them there as financial officers. But of course, we have to work with white people who are conscious. We can't just take white people who want to control everything. We must take those who are willing to work with our communities because most of the NGOs in South Africa, you can go online, whether check section 27, Agri Forum, or uh, Equal Education, whatever. The tricky about them, white-led NGO, they want to earn salaries of executives in private sector. That's the challenge we're facing. The money that was meant for the NGO, it goes to the salaries of these white people because suddenly they've got the life standard they want to maintain. Now, that is the challenge. The last point on issues of new institution. I think, I mean, we, we must work with institutions that are willing to change. But as activists, we've got a responsibility, for example, to make sure that the change that is, is said to be taking place is not artificial change, is the real change. And we must be willing to push back these people when they make certain changes, we then question what is the nature of those changes? What is the character of those changes? And at the same time, these people need to be assisted. Power, we must remember, does not get to be given away willingly, freely. It must be taken from those who've got power. And I think that's the responsibility of us as activists to take power and engage and not be fear. For example, if now there is a um, a uh, roads must fall, uh, and then I mean, there's a roads must fall institute at UCT. We're not gonna go away from UCT. We will be there to make sure that that roads must fall institute is operational. It's happening according to our wishes, and the real change can take place. Thank you Thank very much. You, Thank you. And Alan, as the last answer, um, I think. Um, I guess as everyone was speaking, I was kind of thinking about this idea that uh, institutions aren't horizons. I don't think institutions are robust um, enough places for us to to um, invest all of our time and energy into. And, and by that, I mean, in the worlds that we seek to build, right? These worlds that must account for everybody, um, these institutions don't exist. Like th there is no kind of hierarchical forms of organization, right? And so um, I think it's always necessary to treat the institution with suspicion, to um, enact a kind of strategic relationship with it where you um, are able to, like I said before, garner um, and redistribute resources when and where you can um yeah and and to to be ready to abandon it when and if necessary so i think it's it's always about having a dynamic relationships um a, a dynamic relationship to the institutions to which you know many of us emerge from many of us are indebted to in specific ways but understanding that these institutions in and of themselves are not conduits for the kinds of freedoms that we're talking about and the and especially the kinds of freedoms that decolonization as a as a project of unsettling um offers us um yeah
Thank you. Thank you so much to our wonderful panelists and for all the attendees, everyone engaging and watching at home. And a huge thank you to Stephanie Garand and the rest of the team for organizing the panel and the festival. Um, this has been such a great conversation. I'm sure we have a lot of a longer reading list and a lot of things to look into. So thank you all for your time. Um, and then the next e event this evening is a joint book launch for Islam on campus and essays on secularism and multiculturalism. Thanks. <laughs> thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.